Hi, I'm Bob Hawk. Um, I'm an independent film consultant, advisor, and an occasional producer. And I'm in Berlin in February of 2016, very happily celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Teddy Awards. I was there at the beginning, and I'm still here. I did, um, you know, as the interviewer, I did my proper research, and I found quite a lot about your life and your career and your relationship to the arts and your dedication to the arts, too. And um, I chose to start with a really broad question, and I would like to know in the beginning what film means to you. Well, film has revealed myself to me. It holds up mirrors that take me places in my own psyche, in my emotional life, uh, that I may not even be conscious of all the parts of me that it's hitting. Uh, film is to me more like a dream where theater, and I worked in the theater for years before I ever became involved in film, is more immediate it's very present in the moment and it only happens that one time and there's no two performances exactly the same and I have done eight shows a week for weeks and weeks and weeks and it's never the same film once it is finished and all the post-production work is concerned it exists as it is for all time and you do not have the choice to look somewhere where the camera isn't or if it's a close-up that's all you see um, and so I go back to films that I have seen earlier in my life and I see things that I did not see before. So film changes in that way, but it's only because you've changed. And you see it through all the experiences you've had since the last time you saw that film. So You are also a person that uh, came up in quite you know, political times and where I, I would say cinema or film was also used as a political tool in a way, talking about liberation struggles or um, coming from like maybe minority perspectives. Uh, you were in San Francisco and you had a qu quite crucial role in sort of like establishing the independent film scene there with a the festival. Um, what relationship do you think film also has to politics and liberation struggles? Why is it has it been such an important tool for, the, for communities like that? Well, I happened to be in San Francisco in the 70s and in the 80s, and a lot happened there. And we're talking about gay activism. The 60s was anti-war, uh, and I was involved with that also. Actually, the first time I ever marched as a gay person was in a small contingent in San Francisco that it was a, not a gay parade it was a parade against the Vietnam War and we were a very small group at that time anyway um, I I went to San Francisco when gay people were migrating from all over the country centering on the Castro area and um, it was a time where I was leaving theater I was evolving toward film but I hadn't become really in 
involved yet. So I, I was doing a lot of shit jobs, you know, just to pay the rent in order to volunteer for political organizations that were fighting for gay rights. And I, uh, I certainly found it empowering to be in San Francisco in that era. And that's when I saw Word is Out, a, a seminal film made by a collective of gay men and women who traveled around the country and interviewed gay people of all ages and ethnicities and s sexual identities. Uh, and I saw that and I was inspired. And s um, Rob Epstein, I first met him he was part of that collective and I got to know Rob and I was living in San Francisco at the time that Harvey Milk was shot and Mayor Moscone and Rob was working on a slideshow about gay activism and Harvey Milk was, was a character, but it was a slideshow. Anyway, that happened in 78, and I worked with Rob on writing grant proposals and articulating what the film could be and how important it was. And it ended up, after five years of raising money, we went into production in 1983. And that changed my life, working on the times of Harvey Milk. Uh, I learned so much about how a documentary is sculpted in the editing room and how you can manipulate footage and well, it's just, I could talk for hours about what a school it was for me, but by the time I got through working on that film, um, the nonprofit physical sponsor was the Film Arts Foundation, and I not only joined that organization, but I created a job for myself. and. I worked at the Film Arts Foundation for eight years and got to know a lot of filmmakers and watched a lot of films. And because of my theater background as a stage manager and giving notes, I gave good notes to filmmakers when they were in edit or even in script stage. And uh, there were all kinds of issues dealt with in these films, but I particularly identified with and became involved with what was not yet referred to as the queer scene, the LGBT scene. It was actually the gay scene in the late 70s, early 80s. So what, what role does the relationship of art and politics and the queer scene, why do they, why did they go together or why was it important to work on all these different levels in society, you know, on the artistic, on the political, on the collective? Why do you need all these spheres of society to like work together in order to achieve, you know, new ways of life or just accept it or um. well it's a particular way of life that you choose you choose your friends you choose who you work with uh, if it's not a shit job where you're just paying the rent 
but if you're passionate and care about what you're doing, there are like-minded people, but they're not like all the same. It's very individualistic, and a lot of people in the art in the arts, the artistic community, are gay. I mean, it attracts a lot of gay people, and I think that everyone, no matter what their sexual orientation is, when they work in the arts, they see the potential for sending a message, although I do not like message films that hit you over the head with the message. It's actually these people that you talk about, the arts and queer and politically active. Well, the queer people have always had to fight for the right to be recognized. It's been quite a fight over many years. And I think it has changed. And that what has been created so far, as far as queer art, with the internet and with exposure to young people who are gay, but they have more access to information. So there's a growing sophistication and acceptance. It's not like we ha are now rid of homophobia, but certainly the arts, and it can be more heavily uh, political, documentaries that are issue oriented mm -hmm. but it can also be a lot more uh, subtle but it's this uh, combination of of the entities you mentioned uh, the groups of people that come together naturally I think in that time when you were coming of age in a way um, what were your biggest fears and I mean like real fears, what did you have to face? What kind of fears did you have to face and what challenges did you have to overcome? Coming of age. And I mean coming of age, not only 16, 17, but really also throughout your 20s and um, maybe also, I mean, you know, it, it's like a part of life, you know, fears. Uh, well, but, but like your early really just tough, you know, challenges that, that came across your path. Well, you know, I knew when I was young that I was on the effeminate side and I don't know when or how I thought, well, I can't fake it, like try to be butch, <laughs> you know. And I was vulnerable because I had a speech impediment from the age of four, and that makes you v <laughs> And that makes you very vulnerable when you cannot talk. Um, promptly and uh, where you sometimes in class uh, can't get your words out and all that. So that made me vulnerable at a very young age. So I already felt vulnerable. And I think I, well, I knew I was gay before I knew the word gay <laughs> or homosexuality. I was about six or seven. I saw a certain film which let me know. It's all in the movie about me called Film Hawk, <laughs> where I talk about this movie, and it's the adventures of Robin Hood. 
And I just I got this feeling about all these men living in the forest together. <laughs> and you wanted to be with them. Yeah. So anyway. Spending some time in the forest. All I'm trying to say is that fear, for a while I feared any physical bullying, which I did not get. I was never beat up. Kids tease me. But somehow I just said, well, if they want to tease me, fine, but I can't do anything about it. I couldn't, and I think it's because I had the speech impediment also, that I couldn't fake it, that I was too vulnerable. So I just was me, and something was protecting me from physical violence. The fears that I had growing up were being able to maintain my safety, physical safety. I feared eventual, you know, being beat up or something, you know, but I wasn't. And I just kind of kept on going. Oh, and one thing that was important, around uh, the age of 10, I found out I didn't stutter on stage. So I got involved in theater in, in my community. And I could talk on stage without st stuttering. So it became an escape for me. And, and a home, a haven. And I got involved in local theater. When there wasn't a role for me, I did whatever needed to be done. I did scenery, props, anything and everything. And I preferred the company of adults. Uh, but fear of being exposed as a as a queer I don't know for some strange reason I always felt that if people really paid attention they knew and so what are they going to do about it <laughs> so to speak I had wonderful parents my father was a minister he was beloved by his congregations we moved occasionally, but um, he was all about love and not judging. And so when I was a sophomore in college, I was able to come out to my parents. I wrote them a letter. And so I was out before I entered my 20s. I was out to my parents. And that was more important than anything else. And they, and their reaction, they practice what they preach, Christian love, which is all about not judging. They were concerned about my, my safety, my well-being, my future happiness, but they, gave me unconditional love and support and I educated them and they learned a lot about gay things from me and so I feel very fortunate that you know I I had demons I had fears I had all kinds of insecurities but it wasn't tied up with my sexuality. It was fear of failure. Um, I, I'm kind of a perfectionist, which is good when you're a consultant and an advisor for other people, but I'm very, well, I'm learning how to be less hard on myself, but I was very hard on myself. 
I never really satisfied myself. I always thought I could be better. So I feared failure, not doing really well. And when did your community and the artistic environment you moved in grow like internationally? When did you start oh. leaving the United States? And yeah. I think these are m moments that are very important on, on a person's career or life in general when they start first moving out of their home environment and um, living new places, leaving their own country, you know, getting a culture to new realities and everything. Well, it has all to do with Berlin. Um, let me backtrack a little. The initial community which really offered me comfort, a haven, was the theater community, the creative community in the U.S. And so I had that for years, show business, you know, I could be me. Now, when I worked on the Times of Harvey Milk and I began to work at the Film Arts Foundation, I became a spokesperson. I did outreach. And one of the first things I did outside of the country was that I represented our independent film community in San Francisco at the American Indies booth in the market at the Berlin Alley. That was in 1978. I mean, pardon me, 1987. The, uh, the reason 1978 has such a significance for me is that's when Harvey Milk was shot. And so I, I have a kind of dyslexia sometimes between that and 1987. It was when I had the responsibility of going out, it was the first year I went to the Sundance Film Festival and right after Sundance I came to Berlin and I helped with the American Indie booth in Berlin. And uh, It just was so natural. Uh, and Berlin, this was before the wall came down. Two years before, yeah, two years before. And Berlin was quite um, decadent. West Berlin. West Berlin. Yes. East Berlin was another. Probably not, that's a different story. <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah. uh, Although I went over to East Berlin and everything was very furtive and very repressed, but it was there. <laughs> and with decadent, you mean like? Um, well, I stayed in, what sense? In, in a pension on the Kudam, the Arco Pension, where a, a lot of gay people stayed who were in indie film. And so, pension. Decadence and gay people. Oh, well, and there are all these clubs, you know, but just to give you an idea, on the ground floor of the Kudam, right near uh, the Kempitsky, which is a grand hotel, was even grander then, there was a bordello, a heterosexual bordello. Like a brothel? Or? A brothel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Like a bordel, bordel. And, uh, but I was, of course, immersed in the queer community in San Francisco. But I went to Sundance, and some of the staff and the volunteers, they were kind of queer too, you know. All f festivals are queer, even if they aren't LGBT film festivals. There's always queers at any festival, I think. Except maybe in Russia, but <laughs> any, 
anyway, well, there are uh, certainly activists. Anyway, y you come to Berlin, and there were queers all over the place. It was full of queers. And Manfred Salzgeber and Wilhelm Speck had Panorama, and they created the Teddy Awards the year, the, my first year there. I went to the first Teddies, which were held in the Prince Eisenhardt's Gay Bookstore, and it still exists to this day. But this was a very, very humble affair, and you know, that place couldn't fit a hundred people. And it was the first year, so it was very, very simple. And they had these little 10 inch TV monitors playing gay shorts, I guess. They were shorts, but I mean, on top of stacks of books. And when they gave out the teddy bears, they were little, fuzzy, real teddy bears. Real teddy bears. Anyway, every year there was a meeting for gay filmmakers, gay film festival directors, and programmers, curators, anyone who was involved in gay film in any way, gay journalists. Like a network. network, we, meeting, like a network we met. There was a, a meeting time, and it was usually an afternoon for a couple of hours. And it began on a rather small scale, but it was amazing how many people were there at that first meeting. And it included, and this is so important, it included people from countries behind the Iron Curtain. And it was an act of bravery because there could be spies. And, and before the wall came down, and even afterwards for a while, in Eastern Europe, homosexual activity was verboten. You know, so the mere fact that they appeared were visible, was amazed me. And they told us about tales of how they had to smuggle in film prints, like 16 prints and uh, VHS tapes. They had to smuggle them in, and they showed them at clandestine screenings, often underground, literally, in basements but they were secret screenings. So one immediately got the feeling that Berlin offered some kind of haven for us to get together, but it was not always all that safe. Uh, but how did, how did this entire experience and your fo first like, exposure to a truly like international and cosmopolitan like scene how did that change your personality how did it change your view on the world and your oh. sense of being in the world well I became aware of gay people from all over the world and it expanded me for one thing I was seeing films from all over the world more and more as time went on more and more countries, more, and it was a natural, organic growth. It, it certainly opened me up tremendously uh, to being more aware in a visceral sense because I was actually meeting people and became friends with people. Uh, and 
it just enlarged my horizons. It, it certainly gave me an idea of how different gay identity can play in different countries. You know, just that in some countries it's more low-key, in others it's more flamboyant. What did, what did it teach Amadovar, his films really opened me up a lot. How did it change your view in America? Leaving America and seeing, seeing the world, you know what? Um, I don't know that I it changed my view of America because my America was the world that I moved in. The world that I moved in. Um, so, I just, I don't think it changed me. It enlarged me as a person. But I just went back to a very accepting community that I was fortunate enough to be a part of. And it wasn't when I went to San Francisco in 76. It was something that I had when I first moved to New York in the early 60s. When I um, had the theater community, which was also so. So my view of of America is through the filters of being around a lot of people who are activists, who are political, who are openly sexual. Uh, uh, it's an unusual life in a way, but I'm very thankful for the various communities and families I have found wherever I go. Because, I, I, because I've never been closeted. By what like major decisions or choices is your life marked? What major decisions did you... Do you remember like any decisions or choices you made in your life that like set the path for certain meetings or because life is about making decisions in the end you know you choose to move places to take jobs to leave jobs what are like um, crucial choices that well crucial choices that I made were this as I told you I found out I didn't stutter on stage and so I thought I'd pursue an acting career, but as I went to New York and we got to know actors, I knew I was not cut out to lead the life of an actor, which is very harsh, very harsh. So one of the most important decisions I made was I'm not going to be in front of the camera or on stage, I'm going to be backstage or behind the camera. That was a major, major decision that I made. And, and it like informed all your like later well, yes, it, it, stops. It, or like it showed me my path. But show business, and when I use the term sh show business, I mean ma mainly theater and film, but it's true in dance, music, you know, and the fine arts. You know, it's a crapshoot. It's so un unstable. And I am so used to doing shit jobs. I've washed dishes, I've bust tables, I've been a clerk, uh, various kinds of clerks, <laughs> it's selling, selling various kinds of things. You know, I've just done a lot of jobs that I wouldn't want to do but I accepted 
the precariousness mm -hmm. of the business. But I found a home. And for instance, Film Arts Foundation was a nonprofit organization. I got a decent salary, and I also got to travel. And therefore, I met a lot of people. So, you asked me about important decisions. Deciding to leave theater and to get involved in independent film was an extraordinarily important decision for me. But I thought I could bring all I learned to the theater to filmmakers. One thing, I was seeing all these feature narrative films that were shot before the script was ready. Before um, it was developed like you develop a script when, it, when you're in theater where you rehearse for four to six weeks before you go into preview and then you open and you do it eight times a week. Film is one time only. And two, I saw too many films that were shot before their script was developed. So I thought I could offer dramaturgical help by working on scripts before they sh uh, shot. But I also began going into editing rooms and it, it, giving notes on cuts of films. So, so you have a lot of experience. You, you've been an advisor for many different projects. And I, because we've talked a lot about the past and your, you know, the decisions you, you've made, the context you were involved in in San Francisco, and now you live in New York again or um, on the East Coast. But how have you experienced, or how are you experiencing right now the new generations coming up? You know, the new, maybe not new stories, but stories told from different perspectives, more complex oh. perspectives. Where are we heading to? You know, this is something we should talk about as well. Oh yeah, well, it never gets boring. Okay. That's... Good. <laughs> that's quite promising. That's the that's thing. That's very promising, yeah. you, you, I have seen queer film evolve over the years. And more queer films from more countries. It's more open now. Uh, and there's more sophistication. And there are more films where being gay is a given and it isn't an issue. And it's a film that is about people living their lives and they happen to be gay. Uh, I would say the level of sophistication and craft, I mean, there are more good gay films now than there ever were. There was a time when, you know, you were grabbing straws, whatever film had any gay content, you I kind of held on to because there wasn't all that much, <laughs> you know. But now, there's a lot to choose from. Do you think there from is a, all there's, over the world? Do you think there is a danger of becoming too comfortable, or no normalizing things? No, or? we're not allowed to be that comfortable. Uh, I don't think we have lived enough. I I don't think we've lived enough generations where we can feel comfortable, yet I see acceptance accelerating as new generations grow up. Um, so really, uh, right now, I'm just seeing such a, a, a variety of films that are good, but it's not like there aren't still problems and angst and fear. Uh, but I'm hoping that with the 
internet and access to information and queer film that young people actually we're all, all already seeing people who are growing up now young people where it's not a, a, a big deal at all but we're still dealing with old straight white men and and they haven't obviously lost all their power yet and so will we ever reach utopia I don't know but I do know this and I will say this on the 30th anniversary of the Teddy Awards that we've come a long way and if there's as much change in the next 10 years as there was in the last 30 years, we're going to be pretty fine. I plan to live to be 100. I'll be 78 soon. So in 10 years, I'll only be 88. And I, I plan to see a lot of great stuff happening. And uh, we have world issues that we have to be concerned about. But I don't think gay issues are going to be as important to a lot of people because they're, they're going to have to deal with deep shit. Our environment, the, the economy, you know. Being gay is going to not be as much of an issue for most people unless they're very, very in, in very remote areas, if you know what I mean. You know, we are facing such global crisis issues that Hopefully, being gay will uh, be more of a pleasure and we'll be able to enjoy each other. And when I say enjoy each other, I mean enjoy everybody. Um, I, I'm also interested in talking about film again. What do you think a, a good or a excellent filmmaker needs? What talent and what um, skills uh, does it need to be a good filmmaker, storyteller? Well, this is for beginning filmmakers who are considering making films. Without passion, forget it. If you don't have to make something, don't make it. Filmmakers, there are too many films that are obvious in their uh, lack of passion. And it's obvious that the, the, when meeting the filmmakers that they're more into the idea of being filmmakers than they are of having something to say, that it's cool to be an independent filmmaker. So, also, uh, besides, hopefully, having to get something out, way, you know, on your first film, do not try to make a genre film, a film noir, uh, a Western, you know. In, in, in other words, make something, and you should probably make some shorts before you make a feature. Th things that are close to the heart, that are from your life, are things th 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 that come out of who you are. And 
then after you have some films under your belt you may want to uh, make some genre films or even make parody satire so so what what is that one one sentence advice you would you would give to young emerging artists and filmmakers living in these times you know like considering the times we live in right now too one sentence one sentence <laughs> Well, I think I said it in a way. Don't make a film unless you have to make it. It could be as simple as that, or it could be a longer s sentence. Uh, but um, our world is cluttered, you know that the number of entries to a film festival are vastly l larger than the number of films shown in a film festival. There, is so, there are so many films that are dreadful and they're boring and they have no passion. They have no, nothing of interest to say. They are, they're dead in the water. I mean, they're just inert. What can I say? Don't make a film unless you have to make it. Thank you so much, Bob Hawk, for coming to Berlin, celebrating the uh, 30th anniversary of the Teddies. Yes. And sharing your wisdom with us. Yes. Um, I'm very excited about the 30th anniversary of the Teddies because I've seen them grow and grow and they are now officially recognized by the Berlin Alley. They are an official part of the festival and this is quite an achievement and it's a healthy sign. Thank you.